Welcome to Hot Topics. I'm Marnie, your host with the Prescott Valley Chamber of Commerce, along with Eddie and Bill and Brady's out there and Gloria. And we're all here with a great, beautiful, starting off the lovely month of May. A lot of things going on this month. School ends. We've got graduations. Uh, just a lot of fun stuff. Prescott Valley Days, Team Up to Clean Up. So many things go on in May. New this year, we've got the Prescott Valley Music Fest happening May 15th, uh, 19th and 20th. So, and then the Memorial Day holiday. So, a lot of fun stuff. May's a big month for us. Should be a big month for you. And we're going to kick it off first, talking about graduation, the end of school, and our kids, and the opportunity to continue having meals in their lives with the, uh, the program that's supported through Humboldt Unified School District. So join me in welcoming Pam Liuzzo, our nutritionist. Come on in, Pam, talking about the summer lunch program, which really pretty bit much begins right when school ends. Pretty much. Let's give her a round of applause. Uh, so <clears throat> our summer meal program will be at four sites this year, the same four sites that it's always been at. Um, it'll be at Coyote Springs, Humboldt Elementary, Lake Valley and Mountain View Elementary. So um, this program is um, a wonderful program. It is um, sponsored by the USDA. And what we do is we provide free breakfast and lunch for all children who are 18 years and younger. And these children don't have to live in the area. They could be visiting, I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, they come to the sites and we feed them. We have wonderful meals, uh, an all-you-can-eat garden bar at breakfast and lunch, great entrees. Uh, we also have some events set up for the students, for the children that come in. We've got uh, Matt Force that's going to be um, coming in during lunchtime, as well as Yavapai County Health Services. It's going to be, um, they'll have some booths set up where they do some nutrition education and uh, physical fitness activities. Uh, Her Heritage Park Sanctuary, who is one of our favorites, will also be at our four sites, and they bring all kind of, kinds of wonderful animals and rodents and different things to the sites, and the kids love to see that. Um, and also we have health educators from the Valley, they're interns, that will come and visit us um, and do activities with the students. So it's not just food that we're providing, but we're also providing um, education and entertainment. Um, hopefully uh, we will also re be receiving a grant from the Dairy Council, hopefully. Um, we have for the last several years, and with that grant, we've been able to provide bicycles for um, dozens of students um, during the summer program. So um, if we get that, um, that's what we'll be doing again. If we don't, we still have lots of fun things for the kids to do, lots of prizes. Um, so this year we're doing a little bit differently um, just because of participation. So at Coyote Springs and Humble Elementary, they will be serving lunch only, so no breakfast. Um, it'll start June 4th and it will end July 19th. And lunch will be from 10.30 to 12. So we've extended the lunch time a little bit for those sites since we aren't serving breakfast. But at Lake Valley and Mountain View, breakfast is from 8 to 9 and lunch is from 11 to 12. And um, meals start there May 29th and will end July 20th. Um, Another great thing about this um, program is that the kids just show up. There's no paperwork. There's no checking IDs. They show up. We feed them. They eat a great meal, um, hopefully win some prizes, um, and then they go home with full bellies. Um, I mentioned that we're doing the fun activities with Matt Force and Heritage Park Sanctuary, um, but we're always looking for other organizations that may want to join in. So if you um, are part of an organization that promotes uh, health and wellness, give me a call. My number is 928-759-5017. Um, let me know if you're interested because we'd like to get more um, things for the kids to do over the summer. Um, the summer program is great, but also during the school year, we also have a great program. And I'd like to encourage uh, parents to visit their, their child's school and have lunch with their student and see what our meal program has to offer. Um, we, we get phone calls from parents you know, with questions, and um, it's just so much easier um, for the parents to come in and actually have a meal with the student. Um, adult meals are only $3.75. You get a great meal. Um, during the summer program, adults can eat with their children as well. It's only $3.75, so it's a smoking deal for a great meal. Um, and you get out of the heat and um, have a, 
hopefully some uh, fun prizes and um, some good organizations will be there to to help uh, make the summer go uh, not too quick but um, we'll make the summer a little more enjoyable um, is there any questions open to uh, is all children or just those that are let's say um, siblings of families that maybe aren't in school yet Can no it's come? for all children so say you're a grandparent and your uh, grandchildren are visiting here from the summer and they live in another country mm -hmm. um, they can still come to the program and, and have a free meal so they don't have to be um, they don't have to live here they don't have to go um, to the Humboldt School District they just have to be a child who is 18 years or younger and that's and it Pam, did you mention how that's made possible? That's such a generous offer to our community. It's through um, the USDA. Um, they they provide the funding for this, and that's how we're able to do it. So, yeah, and we're not the only ones either. I, I Prescott does the same thing, and, and Chino does as well. So <clears throat> there's, you know, lots of different places for the, the children to go. We want them to come and see us, though, because we feel we... You know, we do a great job. It, they all do, but um, we'd love to have the kids come and visit us. And it's not just for those children that, um, you know, maybe don't have enough in their kitchens. It's for all children, regardless of income. So um, when my kids were smaller, I'd bring them in, um, and it was great. They loved it. And it also helps to keep our staff employed over the summertime, um, which we try to do. So it, it's a win-win for everybody. Any other questions? You know, I always remember that it didn't matter what we had in the house, everybody else's food was always better. <laughs> Even food at school. Mm -hmm. And cafeteria has come a long way since back in the dark That's ages why when I, want I went the to school. That's why parents to come to the school. They need to come school. and see. Yeah. Yes, and if you're also on the HUSD website, you are always posting mm -hmm. menus, pictures of food, what's going, you know, it's just very nutritious but very fun. Kids relate, they love it, and you know, it's a good place for them to eat. So, mm -hmm. again, you do an amazing job. Thank you. And she loves her job. I do love She's out job. there, does education, and she dresses up, and we've got the best lunch ladies in the state, I think. Thank you. I so, agree. Great job, Thank Pam. You. Thank you. Thank you. And just to tell you, talking about nutrition, Pam talks the talk and walks the walk. She works out. She's a bodybuilder. She won awards based on her fitness and so congratulations to you Pam it was all I said you look beautiful fabulous okay we're gonna keep going but again take your kids to lunch there's no reason they don't have lunch they don't have a variety they have some fun in their summer so again thank you to Humboldt Unified School District and the USDA for helping support our children and our families okay we're gonna keep going now joining me now is Felipe Guerrero he is with the Highland Center for Natural History if you've not been out there it's one of my favorite places in the, the Quad City area in Arizona um, it's our little oasis um, set off and it's in town but not town you feel like you're a million miles away out there in the middle of the woods and I could say I could get there in 10 minutes from here so again, come on, Felipe, and welcome from the Highland Center for Natural History. So much going on out there. A lot going on. Don't forget to mention your Shakespeare oh, in yeah. the Pines, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Coming on. Uh -oh. Thank you, Marnie. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Felipe Guerrero. I'm the Education Director at the Highland Center for Natural History. And um, if you're unfamiliar with the Highland Center for Natural History, uh, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we're located uh, out in Prescott National Forest. We operate uh, uh, on a special use permit out there and uh, a lot of bio, uh, biological diversity at the site that we're at and that's kind of what we're all about. We connect adults and children to uh, the natural world. So it doesn't matter uh, what your interest is in the natural world. It could be plants, it could be animals, it could be geology. Um, we're your spot if you're interested in anything nature. Um, and we do uh, a variety of educational programming at the Highland Center. Um, adults, children, um, we have a new senior program we've instituted working with uh, some of the, um, some of the uh, uh, senior living facilities located around town. Um, we have a brand new facility called the Discovery Gardens, which is a native botanical gardens. Uh, we, uh, we've done uh, the best that we can to vegetate that area with native plants or regionally native plants. Um, it's very beautiful this time of year. We're, we're thankful for the rain that we've just gotten because uh, we've, we've actually just bought a lot of plants and uh, are setting up for our annual fundraiser, a native plant sale. Um, and the Discovery Gardens, uh, the Discovery Gardens is a beautiful facility. 
um, with interpretive signage and uh, people can come out and wander around. It's sort of a, about a quarter mile uh, of trails with pavers and there's also facilities available to rent out there, a ramada, um, including uh, some of the Discovery, uh, some of the Discovery Gardens um, uh, spaces adjacent to the ramada. Um, lots of people like to, to do events out there. Weddings is, are, are particularly po popular. Um, so uh, the, uh, the native plant sale happens once a year around this time of year, and um, we have all sorts of native plants, trees, shrubs, um, wild flowers are extremely popular. And uh, it's this coming weekend, which is May, what would that be, 5th and 6th? Uh, Saturday and Sunday. Oh, I have it right here. Um, and uh, and uh, we do a members pre-sale party on, on Friday night. Uh, actually, it's from 2 to 6 this year, uh, where Highland Center members can come out and have sort of their first pick of, of the batch of native plants. Um, and uh, other than the native plant sale coming up, we have a new festival. We've, uh, since opening the Discovery Gardens, we've started throwing uh, festivals. Uh, we have about four or five per year in, in between the months of March and uh, uh, October. Um, the upcoming festival is actually celebrating migratory birds. Uh, this is the peak of bird migration in this region. So um, uh, International Migratory Bird Day, or what's now known as World Migratory Bird Day, um, is on May 12th, which is the weekend following the plant sale. And that's going to be a family fun event where kids and, uh, and uh, adults can all come, and there'll be activities for everybody. We have two keynote speakers, one Noel Fletcher from the Prescott National Forest, um, two uh, Ty Suplee from Arizona Audubon is coming up. She's going to speak about uh, conservation of birds and, uh, and uh, the importance of riparian uh, and other waterways in Arizona for for conservation of migratory birds. Um, and uh, we've actually instituted a couple of new uh, programs. Uh, we have an, a new series called Art in the Outdoors. It's sort of a transformation of uh, what used to be a colored pencil drawing series. So it's still, it's still featuring colored pencil drawings and the instructor, Diane Iverson, is extremely talented. Uh, we, now call it, uh, we now call it Art in the Outdoors. And that takes place in the Discovery Gardens. Uh, if you're interested, uh, beginner or intermediate, advanced, um, uh, working with Diane out in, in the Discovery Gardens on your, uh, on your art skills is, is really uh, enjoyed by a lot of folks. She has quite a following. Um, and then Insights to the Outdoors is an adult program that we've instituted recently. Um, it uh, also, also takes place in the Discovery Gardens. Uh, it's sort of a three three or so hour workshop um, on all things uh, having to do with nature. This upcoming Insights to the Outdoors is on ants and ant diversity and ecology, which a lot of people obviously interact with ants but don't really realize how immensely diverse they are and, uh, and what the importance of their ecological roles are. So that, that course is taking place, I think, uh, the third weekend this, this May. Um, actually, I've got it right here. Yeah, it's May 26th that course is taking place. Um, a couple of other things we have coming up. Uh, the, the Chautauqua series that we did in 2015 is coming back again, and this time it's going to be hosted in the Discovery Gardens. Um, we're having uh, John Muir, uh, Rachel Carson, and Aldo Leopold as featured um, presenters. Um, obviously, they're played by uh, performers, but um, the Chautauqua format is very uh, appealing to a lot of folks, kind of a living history sort of uh, interaction. Um, and uh, we did it last in 2015. It was extremely popular. We're partnering with a Peregrine Book Company. They're going to have a selection of their works available for uh, um, purchase. And, um, and that about does it for May. We have nature camps starting up in June, which are incredibly popular. Um, uh, elementary school aged children, actually preschool aged children through middle school, um, we offer nature camps, uh, you know, um, in June and July uh, for, uh, for getting your kids out into nature for, for a full week. So they're a week long, then. They're a week long yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then we have a behind the scenes tour at Embry Riddle Planetarium coming up. Uh, that would be in June, and that's going to be really cool. We're going to have sort of uh, a private showing and then uh, a bit of a demonstration, I guess, about how the facility works. And if you haven't been to the Embry-Riddle Planetarium, it's the only one in central and northern Arizona. 
and it's incredibly cool. So, yeah, that that about does it for me. We do have Shakespeare in the Pines coming up, which is a fundraiser for us, uh, and it's super fun. It's going to take place in the Discovery Gardens, um, and uh, those performances are are uh, are really successful and cherished in the community. So if you haven't been to Shakespeare, uh, check that out. All these are on your website, right? Right. Yes. So check out the website. But even if you just want to go out for, mm -hmm. you know, a walking walk. along by mm -hmm. yourself, I mean, it's a beautiful way to get out into nature and bring the family. Discovery Gardens obviously is accessible to everyone. Right. And like he said, 10 minutes away and you feel like you're a million miles away mm -hmm. in nature and it's beautiful out there. Yeah, it's wonderful. So if you haven't been out there, please take the time to make it on your schedule, your list this year to get out there. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very yeah. much. Good Thanks. to see you. Welcome. Sure. We'll keep on. We're going to hold on to this because I'm going to make some plans myself. Nothing better than getting outside and getting into nature and, and uh, forgetting about everything that's going on in your life. I love that. Okay, next up. May 2nd. You wouldn't believe it. it's raining outside. It's snowing in Flagstaff. When we scheduled this next speaker, it was warm and sunny and kind of scary out there because with the lack of moisture, it's a little dry. But we're taking, getting a little precipitation right now. Probably not enough that we will need. But joining us now is Rick Chase, our fire marshal with Central Arizona Fire and Medical Authority. That'll kind of give us on, you know, this, come on up here. It's kind of, a little bit of dampness is nice, right? But, you know, all too soon, this will be a forgotten couple of days, and we'll be back right to where we started with, with again, our temperatures rising and still the dryness because it hasn't really seeped into the soil like it really needs to be, right? Right, yeah. So plan ahead. <clears throat> He's going to give us some ideas how we can stay safe this fire season. Rick Chase. Okay, well, thank you. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Rick Chase, uh, Fire Marshal with Central Arizona Fire and Medical Authority. And today we're going to talk a little bit about, of course, our, our fire danger out there and what's happening. So first of all, let's start off with, um, we all probably know that the tinder fire is going on right now. This has taken place up in the Coconino uh, Forest, and it was started from an abandoned campfire. So unfortunately, this isn't an uncommon uh, rarity here in Arizona that fires, some large scale fires actually have started from abandoned campfires. So some of the things we're going to talk about is some tips on how you can help prevent wildfires from happening. Um, I believe this fire now is about 11,500 acres. We've had a lot of evacuations and several lost structures. So again, you know, all across this state at this time of year, everybody's out there preaching on wildfire safety and how we can help keep our area safe. And this means people traveling into our state as well. It's very important that people understand how fires start. Um, a real common way that we've seen year after year are, is from things that um, cause simple sparks. We had a wildfire campaign oh, over the last several years called One Less Spark, One Less Wildfire. And basically what we are teaching people is to think about anything you're doing because anything that can create a spark can start a wildfire. And just as a fire investigator here locally, I've been in a, you know, seen a lot of fires over the years that have started in, in just dry grasses, brushy areas because people are either welding, cutting, or grinding near the urban interface. Um, it's where in fire restrictions where it shouldn't be happening. And so again, we've seen some large fires start that way. Just talked about campfires, so I'll touch on that again. It's very important. Um, you know, we're we're going to talk a little bit about stage two fire restrictions, but we're coming into those this Friday at eight o'clock. So the Prescott National Forest, Central Arizona Fire, Prescott Fire Department, Arizona State Forestry, we're all going into stage two fire restrictions at the same time. And the reason why we do it at the same time is because it helps create it helps prevent confusion. Um, from when people are going from one jurisdiction to another. And again, it's our responsibility to help talk to folks that, you know, family members coming in from out of state, out of town, um, on how some of these fires start so that they can help prevent them. Um, so, yeah, campfires is a big one. So those, are, of course, are going to be restricted. We're currently in Stage 1 fire restrictions, and Stage 1 fire restrictions still allow campfires in the campgrounds, in fire rings, um, city and county parks. That's one of the things that's going to go away this Friday once we go into stage two. Um, my 24 years of being here in, in the Prescott area, this is the earliest we've ever gone into fire restrictions. Typically, we go into stage one around Memorial Weekend, Memorial Day weekend. This year, we're about six weeks ahead of schedule. So again, we're going to stage two Friday, and we're, gonna, we're at least six weeks ahead of schedule on that, and we're going to be, remain in stage two 
until we get some monsoonal moisture coming in, which typically is in anywhere from middle of June to the beginning of July. Um, so yeah, we're just going to all have to, uh, you know, think about what we're doing, be safe with it. Um, let's see. Mm. So one of the things we do when we get into our stage two restrictions, we understand a lot of people's jobs are to weld, um, fencing, they may have to do something that has to do with cutting or grinding. So we don't want to prevent people from working, but what we can do is we give special use permits. So folks can call us. Our number is 772-7711, and they can call and set up an appointment to get a special use permit to be able to um, you know, weld in an area, but they have to use some safety precautions along with that. There has to be a fire watch person. There's got to be a water source. There's got to be a firefighting tool. So there's certain things that have to, certain criteria that have to be met in order for them to be able to do this. Um, another thing that we talk to people about at this time is uh, how to prevent, how to prepare their own homes for wildfire. Um, basically, we have what's called pro, uh, defensible space property assessments. And we will do that. Again, you can call the 772-7711 number if you're in our jurisdiction, and we'll come out and give you a defensible space property assessment. What we do is we help teach people on what brush to remove, what other items to remove around their homes in order to, to have a, um, you know, to keep it safe if there was a wildfire that was burning and coming towards their neighborhood or, or their home or property. And what this entails is, you know, removing simple, um, if you live in the forest area, pine needles that gather on your roof and in your gutters, wood piles that may be next to your house, deaden down brush, trees, limbs, materials like that. As we all know, fire needs fuel to burn. And if it doesn't have a fuel, it will not be able to burn. So our goal is, is to remove some of the fuel between the urban interface, the forest area, whatever, you know, is outside of your property, um, remove that fuel between that and your home. That way, if there was a catastrophic wildfire, it wouldn't continue burning on your property, but would hopefully go out once it hits your property. Um, we've had some, again, large-scale fires in our area. One of them that comes to mind is the Dosi fire. And that one, you know, was burning out in the Williamson Valley area. That fire, um, when we came out there to some of our area that borders it, some of the homes there had a really great defensible space on their properties. And we used their, their properties and their residences as examples to others that that fire literally stopped right at their property when it hit because they had such a good defensible space. So again, it's just one of those things that you can look around no matter where your home is and take a look at what you have and what can be combustible. It's on the exterior of your home and ways you can help keep, help make it safer. Um, you know, I mentioned the wood piles, dry grasses. I've seen fires in the middle of winter here in the Prescott Valley area where, um, you know, we just had a snow and two days later we're on a five acre grass fire because the fine fuels are still dry. This winter has been very dry. It's one of, again, one of the driest winters um, I've seen since I've lived here. So everybody in the area is preparing for the uh, a possibility of a very bad wildfire season. So we're really hoping that everybody can be safe out there. Um, Another thing that we're promoting this year is called is the Ready, Set, Go program. And some, some of that is basically just teaching folks on how you can be ready in case there is a fire. And, you know, think about an evacuation plan and a communication plan for your family. Um, you know, where are you going to go? Make sure that everybody has, you know, a way to communicate with each other and having the important items ready. And what that means is if there's a large wildfire and a neighborhood goes into pre-evacuations, that people aren't scrambling at the last minute trying to think of what they're going to get to get out, but you are, you're prepared for it. Of course, some residential properties are going to be more at stake, you know, for this situation versus somebody that may live in the middle of town or in the middle of the city. So again, a lot of it has to go with where you live. So the best way to do is be prepared, have your important, you know, your, your papers, your prescriptions, uh, money, photographs, things like that that, are, that you can't replace and, and have it ready. So that way, if you do get into pre-evacuation notices, which a lot of our residents did last year at the Goodwin fire, we encountered that where a lot of people were getting the pre-evacuation as well as the evacuation notices. Um, along with being ready with that program is um, the Code Red program. That's done through the Sheriff's Office. And you can get on the online, and I believe it's through the Weiss, you know, Yavapai County Sheriff's Office, and it's called Code Red. And what it does is, is it will notify you by phone if you're getting, if your neighborhood is going to be going into pre-evacuation or evacuations. So it's a good way that people can can know what's going on prior to it happening. And again, the biggest thing here is just being prepared. So just to finish up for everybody in, in the community, just everything you're doing, think about safety, think about fire. Um, you know, if you're going to be mowing dry grasses, 
scout the area for rocks because that's a way that a lot of times sparks have occurred and, and fires have started. So anything that you're doing, just try to be safe and try to help educate your friends and family that are coming into town. Other than that, um, that's pretty much it. And your website, if anybody wants to go and look up anything and have any questions. Absolutely. It's www.cazfire.org. And we keep the current fire restrictions on there. We keep updates. We keep our burn permit information on there. And on our prevention tab, we have a lot of other information for the public. So, Great. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Rick Chase, okay. Fire Marshal, St. Hilary's Little Fire Medical Authority. Thank you, Marnie. Great job. And don't become complacent just because we have a little rain. <laughs> That's so. Uh, this rain is just going to sunshine, going to make the grasses grow. It's still going to dry out, even probably, and put us back to where we were. So, again, thank you all, all of our guests, for reminding you that coming up uh, May the 10th through the 13th, Prescott Valley Days. Friday the 11th is our Fiesta del Pueblo, and our Saturday evening Ranch to Table dinner tickets are available, but an evening of fun, carnivals, entertainment, parade on Saturday. So, come on out and join us for the 40th annual. Prescott Valley Day celebration, May 10th through the 13th. Have a great month, everybody. We'll be back in June.